Welcome everybody, Rob Brown here from the Accounting Influencers Podcast Network. And on behalf of our network and our Success in Accounting podcast, we are embarking on a series of panels with prominent and influential female leaders in the accounting and fintech world. And we've got an amazing panel to kick off. I'm going to get these lovely ladies to introduce themselves just in a moment, but we're going to get into some juicy topics today on diversity and inclusion of women and minorities and all kinds of things that are going on. And we've carefully chosen these guests because they are at the top. They are in commanding positions. They are in prominent roles. They are, we may argue, working in a man's world, and we're going to talk a lot about that. This is coming up in social media. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a hot topic, and we're going to get to the bottom of some of the real issues and get some real-life experiences and journeys of people that are out there doing it. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to start with you, Pamela, and get you to do a quick introduction so the audience know who you are, and you panelists don't know each other very well, so that's good for everybody too. Pamela. Very good. Well, thank you, Robert, for including me on this panel discussion this morning. I, I'm I'm excited to meet some other women and have the have uh, some of these topics discussed. So, uh, as you said, my name is Pam Baker, and I am the managing partner of a regional CPA firm. We're located on the east coast of the United States. We are a little bit unique as a CPA firm because we are an audit only firm, and we further niche ourselves by working with government and nonprofit organizations. And so many of the things you're going to talk about today, diversity especially, uh, really speak to not just our firm and our staff and what we do, but the the greater uh, client, you know, that we serve. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Terrific. For having. Thank you, Pamela. Emma, welcome. Hi. Uh, great to hear from you, Pamela. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob, for inviting me today. Um, yeah, my name's Emma, and I am the CEO at um, Creases. We're a um, accounting firm based in Kent, so that's about 15, 20 miles south of London. Uh, we're a sort of multidisciplinary firm offering private client tax, um, audit, accounts, all the usual services. Um, our business, I guess, is different because uh, we're bold enough to say that we want to help make our clients' dreams come true and work with them and our team to deliver our services in a way that gets them closer to where they want to be. So Thank you. Welcome. That's me. Sam Louie, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and it's great to, to see some familiar faces and, and to meet some new ones. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Praxity, which is the world's largest global alliance of independent accounting and auditing and tax firms. We have um, 120 offices around the world, representing some 65,000 professional staff and a turnover of roughly 7 billion. So we, we are based in Epsom, but we really do transverse the globe. And so these issues are not, not localized at all. So it's really great to be sharing with such a global panel today. Sure, well, we're gonna get into it soon. Kirsty, welcome. You're not a wallflower either, are you? We were talking about how good women leaders can't afford to hold back. So uh, a little introduction from you. I think my high school had something to do for that. I think at 11, I probably was a wallflower and then I'm not sure what happened, but it must be down to the school. Um, but yes, I'm Kirsty McGregor. I am the founder and chairman of the Corporate Finance Network in the UK, which is a network of uh, accountancy firms who want to offer more corporate finance services more efficiently to more clients, uh, all owner managed businesses. So regional and, and local accountancy firms predominantly. And I'm also um, the accountant in residence, which is a, a cracking title. Don't do any accounts for them, thankfully. But I'm accountant in residence for Capitalize.com, who are a, a, a platform in the UK who offer capital advisory services and uh, improve the, the credit standing of companies through the accounting channel. We have very, very similar ethos. And therefore, a few years ago, I actually became the accountant in residence. And they have a capitalized women's network. So I'm very proud to say that they take this really seriously. Um, I work for myself now, uh, partly because that was the route I decided to take after I had children. So I'm sure we'll come on to that. Uh, but it's great to work within a team as well at Capitalize who have got uh, this women's network. Yeah, so great. We've set the foundations now. The topic is diversity and women leaders. So Emma, let's kick off with you. Why is this 
such an issue right now? Why are we talking about equity of opportunity, the need for influential women leaders in accounting? Why is it so important? I think there's kind of two strands to it, really. There's kind of the whole moral thing, which is, I think is, um, is, is absolutely an imperative that we treat everyone fairly. Everyone has the same opportunities. Um, you know, that there is absolutely um, an equal playing field for people, but also there's, um, you know, there's a big wide world out there. There's lots of big issues going on. And actually, you've got to put your best team forward. And your best team is a diverse team um, that can look at solving problems, working together, collaborating, using absolutely the widest set of skills and abilities that we have. So it's just a no brainer. Yeah. And and Sam, when we talk about diversity in a team, we know that there are actually more women accountants than men that are qualified. But the challenge, perhaps, is women in leadership roles that are chronically underrepresented. So why is that important to you? So I think it goes back to diversity of thought. I mean, they've made the business case for why leadership needs, you know, not to be a group, a very homogenous group of people. Um, and they've shown that that absolutely adds to the service levels, it adds to the customer satisfaction levels, it adds to the profitability. Um, I mean, unless you're in business to reduce your profits and reduce your return to shareholders, and I don't know anybody who's deliberately in business to do that, why would you not look for diversity? The case is there. Mm -hmm. It's also important, though, because you need more than one voice, because there's a lot of research that's been done that if there's just one voice, it's very difficult for that vo voice to be heard. So you need to have some means of amplification of that voice. And so there's a great club called the 30% Club, which says actually you should look on your board or on your leadership committee for 30% of them to be women so that you make sure that those women's voices are actually heard. Yeah, it's as good a start as any. Uh, Kirsty, corporate finance from my networking experience, mostly men. So yeah, it can be. It definitely can be. Go on. The key challenges for you being a, a woman in accounting and finance are what? Well, this is exactly why I left full time practice at, at the time I had my first child because it isn't with corporate finance. It isn't so much that you work long hours; it's that they are unpredictable hours. So all of a sudden, something will fall and you, and, and it's ready to go and you know you're going to be there till the early hours of the morning, but you don't find that out till five o'clock that afternoon, you know, so it's it's very unpredictable for childcare, which was a choice I made to go into corporate finance. I love the buzz of it and the adrenaline. That was exactly what I wanted to do. And I've managed to stay within that field. And it is very, it is very male driven. I'm glad to say across our network, though, we do have really good spread of female leaders that are full-time corporate finance um, specialists, which is brilliant. But from a practical point of view, and I'm always very practical, and, and of course it's important about having diverse voice and so on. At the moment, I, I don't speak to, I think every firm out there is having problems with recruitment, with resourcing, and there is such a gap between that three years PQE up to 10 years PQE we have we cannot afford to lose good people out of our profession whether they're women men of a different background or or go into industry because they want a more a different challenge you know we, we've got to retain those trained highly trained highly educated experts in what we do because we are suffering so much for it now and if we don't resolve it now we are still going to be suffering with this five years, 10 years down the line. And I think the profession will really struggle then to, to keep keep going. Yeah, Pamela, you're nodding your head at a lot of things that Kirsty and the rest are saying there. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to piggyback on that, I really think that we we found ourselves a little behind and we might not have as many of these gaps right now had we opened this discussion up a long time ago. And had we not in, increased that diversity of thought just around the table, I mean, I came up in my firm, the only female at the table, and I very much can appreciate how one female voice to a whole group of men, you just have to be even more persistent 
um, and speak up even more. And it was okay for me because I'm kind of like one of those kind of people. I don't have a problem speaking up and I, and I didn't ever really shy away from that. But when I look generally at women, it shouldn't be only those women who are okay with speaking up. It should be all women. And I do think that generally speaking again, and of course, statistically it's been shown, women do have a tendency to not wear their confidence as much, uh, to not want to step in until they think they know everything. Uh, and they're a little bit more risk adverse. Uh, mm. So if you don't, if you're lacking in the confidence and you're not as willing to take a risk, it is a little bit more difficult to show up at that table. But clearly, once you do, and once you do have all of that around the table, I do think it gives more of an opportunity for others, the men in this case, to see the benefit of it. And, I, and I've seen that increasingly when we just put it out there and maybe it's Maybe we have to make a rule, you know, that a board has so much representation. But once you do, I do think we're starting to see the the benefit of it. Well, we're going to right some wrongs today and come up with some solutions. Uh, but when you say men seeing the benefits of it, we are generally in a man's world. It wasn't so long ago that men were complaining that women had the vert and women were in golf clubs and women were playing soccer and women were then commentating on soccer and cricket and everything else. So there are barriers to overcome. So I just want to throw this question out to all four of you. And if you've got an answer, come in. But has being a woman ever held you back or narrowed your career options or perhaps those of women that you've known? Just anybody come in with that. I kind of almost struggle with that question because I've ne I've always thought what do I want to do and then set out to do it right. and the question kind of implies that you kind of look for what you can achieve and then you go and do it so it's a prediction rather than an aspiration so I was naturally gender blind I thought that's what I want to do and then I went and did it and then along the way there were uh, you know rump, bumps in the road or whatever but um Quite often I got support. I got a lot of support from uh, men. Uh, I got a huge amount of support from men and they facilitated a lot of the things that uh, enabled me to be doing what I'm doing now. So I think it's kind of, it is a mindset as well as, a, as, as having those opportunities. There is a mindset to it where you kind of think, yeah, you start with the vision and then you go from there. Yeah. But I think I agree with Emma and it was uh, virtually the same way for me. Mm. I did not have those barriers uh, and I didn't really come up against them. But I, again, think it speaks to who I am as a person. Yeah. I think passion plays yeah. very strongly into where you're going to go and how mm. you're going to get there. Yeah. Uh, I have known women and I have had these conversations where they were they did, uh, you know, come up against obstacles, but when you yeah. really drill down, a lot of times it comes back to the same conversation. Uh, they they didn't know how maybe to express their passion. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. They were looking at the male model and saying, "I have to emulate them instead of being their authentic self." Mm -hmm. And so, if you put your authenticity with your passion, that's the challenge, though, for. A, a woman to succeed is to not try to emulate what exists. And then that's going to be counterproductive to the benefits of the diversity that we just spoke about. Yeah. Sure. We'll talk about authenticity. I'm sure Oscar Wilde said, be yourself because everyone else is taken. We're aware <laughs> of that. Sam, when you were growing up, if you like, were the people like you to look up to and get alongside with your career? Oh goodness. No. Um, <laughs> uh, no, is the short answer. Um, I think my generation is probably the first generation that was encouraged to think beyond teaching and nursing as a career, frankly. Um, and so there were a few women who had, had made careers, but generally the kind of archetype of, of, of that woman was, you know, single driven, um, almost more masculine than the men. So if you think about who was being portrayed in movies and TV series at the time. Um, 
I was lucky. I didn't start in accounting. So I started in the communication profession. And there are a lot of very strong women in the um, communication profession. Right. And so I had, I had role models from that perspective who helped me learn to articulate and, uh, you know, make my way into a boardroom, persuade in a boardroom. I'd love to think I always get it right, but I absolutely don't. Mm. Um, but my role models were perhaps not in the accounting profession. Yeah. Kirsty, role models for you? Many women around to look up to? Well, the year that we, uh, my recruitment year at a mid-tier accountancy firm, we recruited two thirds of women in that year and one third men uh, as first year trainees. So there were quite a lot of, um, probably like two or three years above me, maybe you know a couple of years post-qualified, there were women, um, women managers and so on, which, which was great, but really quite strong characters. And I think everything that we're saying really shows that a to, to be this type of authentic person that Pamela was talking about, you've got to have that confidence. And do you have that confidence when you're still only 24, 25? I, I'm not sure. But uh, there was definitely people around that that age for me. And then um, I remember there was, um, I say I worked at a, nas a national mid-tier practice and there was one partner in the London office who was very, very um, outspoken she was the staff partner that's quite often the women often got the job of being staff partner uh but but actually she was also very technical and she had other responsibilities and she went a long way um she was a lady called Teresa Graham who, who got you know a long way in the profession and um and she was like a, a woman partner that I looked up to but I knew nothing about her personally I don't I still don't know if she had I think she did have children but I don't know I don't know her background at all she was in the London office and I was in Manchester so there was her, but I remember going for an interview. You said we can call people out here, Rob. So I went for an interview as a trainee or, or to get a, to get my training contract with one of the big four. And, and they were obviously very conscious of this, even back then. And, and I was only 20, 19, 20. And they rolled out this um, female uh, as part of the interview process stroke, them selling themselves to us as they did. Uh, and she'd just come back from maternity leave. So they were trying to say that, don't worry, you can have a career and have children and come back to work. And I, but I was like 19, 20. I wasn't thinking about children and have, I wanted my career. So I think they were trying, but it was to the wrong audience. You know, it should have been later on and maybe they do it later on as well. I don't know. But looking back at that now, it just makes me laugh that that was their token effort. She'd come back from maternity leave. Therefore, you can have children and come back. You know, and it just seems... 20 years later, 30 years later, actually, it just seems, um, yeah, quite laughable that they thought that that was sufficient. Pam, you said there weren't people like you in, in the boardroom, but were there any men around that were role models that were encouraging you, or did you have a few women that you could lean into? So, you know, when I think about role models, it's interesting, the, the person and mentor that comes to mind is is the managing partner that I replaced, who was an incredible role model for me. And I think that in many ways, if I look at his role in helping me um, through the, the professional lens, uh, you know, he had a lot of the traits. He was a very strong leader, he was very charismatic. He did a great job. He cared about, cared, he had that passion. Uh, if I look at it as a female, I think what I see is that he had no gender bias at all. I mean, I never, ever felt like I was anything different um, than anyone else in our organization. And when I spoke earlier about I was the only female voice at the, at the table, my voice was able to be heard. I, I, you know, I felt confident and comfortable in speaking up and it wasn't totally because I was just a confident person. And so I think he was instrumental in, uh, in my overall development. But I also thought about when I think about this question, and I've been asked this question many times, and my original thought most of the times is there really weren't a lot of women like me today when I was coming up. However, when I dig a little deeper and really think about today, we're talking about it. Today, we're talking a lot about it. And women executives are talking about it. And we are really trying to have a positive impact. But there were a lot of women out there, I believe, uh, or a fair amount. So I, the firm I came from before I'm, I came to the firm I'm at now, which was like 30 years ago. So you're going back in time. 
was a firm that had two female owners. I didn't really pay attention at the time. They were two female, happened to be a firm that I wanted to work for. But those two women, when I really think back, one of them was very strong, probably more like me, but more strong, more wanted to put her voice in there. The other one who was an owner, very successful, quiet, didn't, wasn't one to give her, you know, to, to overly give her opinion, but if asked. And when I think about it now, I think, you know what? They were real role models. I was observing, Christy, to your point, I was young, <laughs> early 20s. But when I think about it now, they were giving me very strong role modeling from the standpoint that you don't have to be that super strong, assertive person. You can be very successful being your, again, your authentic self. And I think that's just become so much more relevant as I think about it today in what does it take. Authenticity is just becoming increasingly important. And I think oh, I have more of an awareness of it than I probably did. Yeah. And it and it's probably a little bit more of a relevant message to send to that 22 year old to be authentic, maybe even more than to be confident. <laughs> you know, that's something that you many times mature into, but yeah. everyone can be authentic. We're going to talk about authenticity in a moment. Emma, you said that you were gender blind and you just got on with things and you root to the top. But was there anyone that stood out as helping you along the way? Yeah, I mean, lo lots of people. Um, you know, I can look back at uh, teachers that I had at school that I that I admired. And I worked I worked very closely with one of the partners at my um, current firm, who's now retired and very similar to Pamela he was completely um oblivious probably to the fact that I was a woman uh, or not you know but certainly um it was all about uh working together and getting the best result for the client and um I think if you can get that close working relation with some someone um you know you do start to realize that actually everyone's bringing something different to the table and that creates a stronger proposition so I think you know, it is really interesting to think about bringing your authentic self to work because I think we can all do that, the women and the men. Well, let's talk about authenticity. I had a podcast recently by Meghan Markle. We all know who Meghan Markle is. Uh, she's brought out a podcast called Archetypes and her first guest was Serena Williams, the tennis player. They both mm. grew up in the same part of LA. They're both exactly the same age. And she asked Serena about the word ambition. And Serena came up with the answer that it was a dirty word, that women couldn't be ambitious. They couldn't have drive, but men could, boys could. It was applauded in boys and it wasn't in women. So, Kirsty, let me ask you, do these words uh, resonate with you? Are they more desirable for men than women? What feedback have you had on your ambition and drive? You know, this is probably one of the first, I know others have said they've spoken about diversity before. I never have. I've never been on a, a women's panel before, um, despite, you know, being in the profession 30 years. Uh, because as I like that expression, gender blind, I think, yes, I had to make decisions uh, about the direction my career took uh, because of the lifestyle I wanted to lead and, mm. and the choices I made. And But I don't feel that that has made me any less successful I've just been successful in a different direction than I may have been if I'd been a man and stayed within the the normal progression through to partner in an accounting practice and it it made me made me laugh last uh, a couple of years ago actually just before before COVID I, I went to do a careers day at my son's school speaking to um maybe 14 15 year olds uh, about the profession and I gave a bit of background about me and it never occurred to me what I was saying um, about my, the direction my career had taken. And at the end of it, they knew my son and they went up to, to my son in school and said to him, you ruined your mum's career by having you. Because when, <laughs> when, she had you, when she had you, she then went and did other things. But I was thinking, but I'm, I'm no, no less successful because I had a child or chose that route. You know, and it, but it made me laugh. Well, it made me interested that, that's what 14 and 15 year olds think, bright kids, boys and girls, um, which is a bit worrying, really. So I think, you know, we've definitely got to start this work earlier and, and definitely spread the word that 
um, it's not about ambition it's about choosing your lifestyle you know and and it can be men or women that choose that lifestyle and any in any background and I think that is happening more and more definitely but you can choose the way you want to live and therefore the way you want to work and that's about being your authentic self isn't it totally. that's about understanding that there is more yeah. than one measure more than one yardstick for what is success and we talk a lot about about what is success for you because what's successful for me isn't maybe not the same as what's successful for you Kirsty. And, and owning your choices and owning what you feel to be success is what yeah. about really what about being authentic is about um the judgment side of it is for other people <laughs> yes absolutely yeah absolutely but and, and gone up but are we ever asked to conform to certain expectations of success uh, for instance i heard the word defeminize recently a lady was talking about how she had to defeminize a little bit to fit in with a masculine environment. Now, I'm talking to four people here that that's probably a really odd word, but uh, Pamela, ambition for you, was that ever a problem? Um, no, I don't think ambition for me was ever a problem. I do understand what you're saying, but I think, and a little bit to, to piggyback on what Christy is saying, another thought here around this is, we're sort of focusing and talking about the boardroom, the corporate environment. If you look at the number of women who, because they've decided I'm going to be myself and I'm going to, to make my way and I'm going to have ambition and it might not be ambition by mirroring what I see in my corporate world, but there are increasingly more and more women who are I'm going to start my own company and I'm going to do it my way. And I think that's where we're going to see more opportunity to really kind of drill down on some of these things, because those of us who have grown up in that environment and have seen some positive changes, that's wonderful. And I think we can see it, but we are living in a place now where the change is here and we don't really know necessarily what's going to evolve from yeah. that. So, you know, I'm excited to see how increasingly the women and others that are ch finding their own path are going to change really what the boardroom even looks like mm -hmm. or, or what a boardroom is, you know, and are we going to, you know, there's another huge movement uh, in our society away from, you know, not just shareholder value, but stock, not just, excuse me, stockholder value, but but the larger shareholder, the larger group, our community, what we're doing. Stakeholders. There. Stakeholders, yes. thank you. Uh, I lost my word. But exactly, it's totally changing. And this is all a part of that. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's good. And so to some extent, we don't have to continue to think about breaking down the stereotype. It's being changed because of some of these other paths yeah. that, that people think like Christy are choosy. But I do think words matter. Um, I do think we have to be careful not to tell, you know, our young girls not to be bossy. We have to be mm -hmm. careful not to tell our young girls, you know, that they must dream and be kind. And, you know, um, we must make sure they have access to toys that teach them to do things um, that might not be considered feminine, um, you know, um, and that they can jump in the sandpit and play with toys and build Meccano and, mm. you know, their Lego doesn't have to be pink. Um, I, 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 do, I do think we need to think really carefully about the words we use. And then that goes into the corporate environment, the words we use in our, in our own assessment of ourselves and, our, and, and when we're performance managing, other, not in a negative way, when we're doing assessments of other people or when we're doing developmental things with them, you know, we really need to think about language because I think that really matters. Mm. Great point. Mm. Like la ambition. Somehow ambition is a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. It's good to be ambitious. It's good to be driven. Well, we, If that's what you want to be. If you mm. don't want to be that, that's also good. Well, <laughs> And we're not here to create issues that are not there, but we've all heard of conversations where men have addressed women who have shown ambition and drive with the words, well, who do you think you are? And what kind of game do you think you're playing? We've heard that. 
So this politics to be played out here, but there are clearly lots of solutions as well. And we're in a more woke world where we're more aware of these things and we may even be overcompensating. Uh, let's talk about your own leadership styles. It's generally considered that men rule a little bit more with testosterone and power based. And of course, I'm generalizing and women are a little bit more empathetic and compassionate. Uh, what kind of a leader are you, Emma, would you say? Um. Obviously, I hope I'm a compassionate leader. Um, and um, well, I think it's you, you as a leader, you really are in service of your team, aren't you? Um, so. You have to understand that it's it's a um, it's a two way conversation and that actually your position is to seek first to understand and then to be understood you. It's about how you um, get those views heard, how you give people a voice, how you create rules where people feel they can collaborate safely, be themselves safely in an organization. Um, it's about being, you know, absolutely accessible and uh, accountable for what you're doing. It's so I, I would say that compassion is a big part of that, but also, there is the ambition, you know, we've got a, a business plan we want to deliver. So you are focused on that. But of course, the best way to achieve that uh, success that, that you've sketched for the business which, uh, is to understand what success means to everyone in your team, what success means for your clients and try and create an environment where you can deliver all those things. Mm -hmm. You will never deliver all those things because that's impossible, but you'll go down trying. No, we well, talk not, about authenticity. Hopefully, hopefully not, actually. Yeah. Don't go down. <laughs> and, and Sam, we talk about authenticity, keeping it real, but there's a place perhaps to be vulnerable and even a little bit weak, or, or is it a danger to show weakness these days as a leader? Oh, I think there's nothing wrong with the tactical weakness, but I think you have to understand, you know, what you're doing. Um, and I think that's part of understanding who you are and what, what your strengths are and maybe where you are vulnerable because as a, as a human so you know find people who complement what you aren't so that you can be strong at what you do and other people can be strong at what they do and together the team is stronger for it mm -hmm. um i if you you know i i have certainly never found and worked with people who are so um, dominant and, but I haven't worked in maybe a corporate finance environment, <laughs> but where people, are, you know, are so dominant that they have no room for any other emotion. Um, most people bring, you know, their life to work. Mm. Yeah, that's the world we're living in, Kirsty, isn't it now? It's, yeah. it's about I think community they do and now. consensus. Yeah, they do now, but they didn't. Uh, if, you know, if we look back, um, you know, 20 years or, or 15 years when um, I I mm. was never speaking about my family, my children. Uh, I was I only went because I was working with um, partner groups of, of accountancy firms who were predominantly men. And in order to get them to take me seriously, I was very focused on the job and and, and didn't really allow them to see my whole self until. I had a baby, uh, my second child, and um, it, I was due to run a conference. Um, so she was born in the June, and I was, uh, and I went into labour actually at Accountex, but that's another story. And <laughs> she was, she was uh, born in June, and my conference was in October, and it was at the other end of the country, and I had to take her with me uh, because she was five months old. And I, I don't get me wrong, I hadn't been working five days a week. But I, I took her to the conference. My parents came with me to help. And at that point, everybody knew she was there. And I think that was the time when it changed. But, you know, she's 13 now. So it's taken it's taken till that time for either me or society to to be more open to the fact that you can talk about your whole self. You can talk about your family. And definitely I found when I was doing it then um, that they responded with talk about their families, whether they were men or women mm. um, or their lifestyle or their, their you know um, activities things they were doing outside of work and and I think we're a lot better now at that than we use and I you know just 
over COVID, we've all looked into each other's living rooms and, and bedrooms or wherever they've been broadcasting from on Zoom that it, and dogs have appeared and children have appeared and cats. And it's definitely, definitely broken down. And I think that is a fantastic thing that we can definitely now be more real and, and to be more human to everybody. And Pam, does your leadership style allow for a blurring of the lines between personal and, and corporate professional? Oh, absolutely. And, and again, I think uh, the pandemic sort of helped advance that. But um, for me, it, it's been very important since I became, I mean, I was a leader of, you know, uh, I was a partner for several years, but when I took over as managing partner, it was definitely another level of leadership. And I really decided early on that I really wanted to be transparent and increase the transparency. Uh, and that was, I think, one of the big differences between a male run environment. I mean, I spoke about my predecessor, he was a great role model, but if I looked at and I, I carefully looked at what the opportunity was and, and the responsibility that I had, and I think transparency became a big part of that. I, I my natural tendency, I think, um, I I have a tendency to be a little bit more of a risk taker. <laughs> so you can't do that and and have, have those people that you're responsible for, you know, feel good about it if you aren't also transparent about it. And then, um, so I really have tried to match those two things. But then I also really strongly support, and we kind of wear it throughout our organization, the concept of just continuous learning, because I, I don't want anyone to think, well, you're at the top, you know, and you're done. <laughs> and I think just, again, showing up and letting people know that uh, I'm on a journey too all the time. And um, I want to learn from, you know, what you, everyone else is bringing to the table. I want to listen, but I want us all to be engaged in continuous learning so that it's a journey and we're working on it together. And it's not, you know, I'm the the one sitting up there dictating everything, you know? Yeah. So I think those are the things that have, have worked, you know, well for my style. And I did plan to ask you about some best career advice for women that are in very male dominated environments or even misogynistic men but you've all been very positive about your experience and and <laughs> it's never been an issue for you so I'm going to pivot that question slightly and say what would your message be to women out there that do aspire to leadership that do have ambition and drive they do want to be authentic perhaps they're pushing up against some cultural stuff or expectations or reputations and things like that and uh, Sam, let's start with you on that one. Career advice tips for the women that are a little bit early in the career, but want to be leaders. So you don't, you, leadership is not something that's next year, next promotion. Leadership is now. What are you doing amongst your peers from a leadership point of view? What roles are you taking on now that will, will enable you to develop and grow your leadership skills? Um, so I don't think leadership's a future. I think leadership's a now, no matter what level you're in in the organization, picking up on the point made earlier about we're always learning. Mm -hmm. so, so what are you doing now? Can you step up to a, an employee forum? Can you um, be a liaison somewhere between two groups, two audits, two, you know, there's always something you can do um, where you can just show an appropriate level of leadership and and you'll learn and the more you do it you know the better you get it's the ten thousand hours we need to do to get good at stuff yeah. so i think that that's the first thing is is don't think about leadership in the future think about it now yeah it's a good point and taking some risks saying yes to things emma what advice mm -hmm. would you give to younger women in the profession yeah i think that's a great point that you raised there sam and it and it really is about i think in, in maybe two two things that showing people so how it's done so if you see stuff that you don't like you kind of if you want to be a leader you kind of have to call that out and you also have to really consider how you do that to respect the people around you and show in a positive way how doing something in a different way might produce a better result for everyone 
and yeah. how that can be a win for everyone. So that does take that does take a little bit of thought because um, but, but if you want to be a leader, you you can't stand by and let it happen. You can't stand by and see these things because that's not leadership. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it is about calling it out and showing people how you can do that in a positive way mm -hmm. and that you're doing it for the best of everybody. Not it, it's that that's a that's a big that's a big part of it. You 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 can't not not on your watch. That's what no. I say, not on my watch. Yeah. You've got to uphold standards and what you condone <laughs> and, and allow becomes the norm, doesn't it, on your watch? Pamela, yeah. you're nodding on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to combine what Sam and Emma are saying, I think that if you want to be successful and you want to be in a leadership role, I think you're right. I think today you're in a leadership role. You're in a leadership role of your, of your life, right? Yeah. Um, but you need to be intentional. You need to set a goal. And I know that, you know, when I was starting out, uh, I think the first goal I set was maybe a five-year goal. My very first goal I ever set for myself was I want to double my salary. That was my but I had a goal and I remember clearly having that goal and I remember working to that goal. And there were a lot of pieces that I kept measuring. We're going to get me there, right? But I think you have to be goal oriented. If you want to be a leader, you've got to, and you know, the generations today, you know, and what we see with our younger people are a five-year goal doesn't mean anything. They don't know what five years is. Their world is so different. And the pace of change is so tremendous that when you say to someone, you know, you need to be goal oriented, it could be a six month goal, a one year goal, but you need to be, you need to be intentional about it mm -hmm. and then put your passion and your drive behind it. Um, and, and then do all of the other things that are being raised here. But you have to be intentional. It's not going to just happen. Yeah, and Kirsty, having the steering wheel on you, having your hands on the steering wheel of your own career is all well and good, but there's unpredictability about a career. It's okay being intentional, but kids happen and COVID happens and other things like that. What would be your tips for the young women leaders out there? I think it'd be the same for the young women leaders or the young male leaders or anybody from any background, to be honest. It's, it's what I've always said to um, those that are either my own children or, or, or younger people that are coming through is always give yourself options, give yourself as many routes as you can, um, you know, and whether that's through qualifications or, or whether it's through work experience or getting your CV looking great, you know, give yourself as many options as you can. I, I just want to touch on one thing, actually, it kind of crosses over something here that Emma, Emma said, which, which is about standing up for yourself and calling it out, if you like, but doing it in a way that's appropriate because you talked about woke rob and um and i think you know we are a, a generation or a world not just a generation but a world where everybody seems to be professionally insulted all the time at everything they take insult at everything we all have the and right I, to be offended every, professionally offended that's the one yeah and i think actually though that they that there needs to be a little bit of um don't get too hung up on some things you know because they they're not really that important and i re i recall at um, a, a big accounting um, um, trade conference that there was a panel there and there was a, a lady on the panel and some men on the panel. And, and this man was talking to the audience and saying, um, hey guys, blah, 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 blah. And then he mentioned guys again somewhere else. I think he was saying, you know, the guys in the room or something. And she was getting so hung up about it. And she called it out every time he said it in public in that audience. Not just guys in the room, not just guys. Now, for me, guys is one of those terms which is not gender specific anymore. Mm, I agree. But she was was going on at him and going on at him in public in this forum. And, and so to me, I don't get hung up about the word guys, you know. And I know some some women do, but it really doesn't offend offend me. I just think it's the general term. So don't get too hung up, but where it is where it is crucial and where there's a a fundamental problem then then address it definitely but the little things that come and go if they're you know they're not um th they're not that offensive then just let let them go yeah uh, just to come back to you Kirsty. absolutely i to absolutely agree with that and i think if you come from a place where i only ever get offended if i think that was the intention and if someone mm. has offended me but i don't think it's their intention yeah 
I will always just have a quiet word with them because, yeah. 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 Some people don't know that they're offending. I'm thinking yeah. of a, a panel I once did on a tele, uh, mainstream television here in the UK. And there were two men and two women on the panel. And the debate topic was who's more equipped for business in the 21st century, men or women? And actually, you know how they get opposing views. And I was yeah. arguing for women. And the guy on the panel, you won't know him, Pam, and, and you may not, Sam, but he's called John McCreerick. He was on Celebrity Big Brother. He, he mm. has commentated on horse racing in the past, but he's very, well, how would you put him? He said on live television, well, this is a bit of a non-question because every team needs a captain and I'm the captain in my house and it's the woman's job to make the tea and they're in the kitchen and I've never made a cup of tea in my life and my father's never made a cup of tea because that's the woman's job. And you could feel the women on the panel were bristling and wanting to punch his lights out, but that is the old world, isn't it? You can't say that now and, and those people are, are fading out, thankfully. Well, uh, but, but maybe you can say that now. Maybe the guy can say that and we can all just step aside and <laughs> regard him as completely and utterly irrelevant. You yeah. know, that's another choice you have, isn't it? Well, let's finish with some words to the leaders out there, your peers, if you like, men or women, to promote a DEI, a diversity, equity, inclusion agenda. What tips would you give to people that are setting culture that perhaps have underrepresented groups, minorities, be that women or anything else? You're obviously out there, you're doing it, you're promoting best practice. Uh, Pam, what would you say? Well, I think I'm going to go back to, you know, my comments about continuous learning. We are all evolving all the time. And if you can, and if you can appreciate that there's always going to be another way to look at something, there's always going to be um, something to learn in the situation. I think if you can stay open-minded to that, but at the same time, be your authentic self. You've got to know what's your value system. What do you value? If you can stay true to that and then open yourself up to in being inclusive and welcoming to everyone that comes into your organization, uh, then I think it will serve you well. Uh, I just, I think it's a tall order. I think it's very difficult. And sometimes things come across that are new to you or new in your world. You know, if you said the word woke to me five years ago, I'd be like, I don't, yeah, I woke up this morning. I don't know what you're talking about, but you know, <laughs> as new things come along, sometimes you do have to sit with yourself and go, what are my values? Or, or you know, what, what is, what's going to be something that's going to cross my line that, if it is presented as I'm opening myself up, I'm prepared for it. I yeah. think that is important to do. So your message to leaders, Pam, is to model diversity and model inclusion and model the traits that you want to see in your workforce and they will follow. Perfect. Yeah. Thank what you. About you Emma? Well said. <laughs> what, what, what are the tips for leaders out there to bring in a good culture of diversity? But you, you've got to be an ambassador for your own culture. You've got to live it, breathe it. And, uh, you know, you, you've, got, you've got to be absolutely true to it um, because, you know, that, I, that, that, is my, that is my trade. What I say is what I do. That, it is as simple as that. But that and that's not just on the job, is it, Emma? You probably do that in all aspects of your life because when you yeah. walk through the door and out home, you, you're still the CEO of Creases. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, you know, it does make, there is a certain simple, simplicity to that uh, that I, I I like and uh, you, you really got to as Pam says kind of challenge yourself around um, you know how are we doing certain processes and procedures in the office how can we be more inclusive how do we widen the net on our recruitment how do we widen the net on on our, uh, to, to attract clients what you've got a no stone can be left unturned really you, you just Again, going back to Pam, you're always learning, open-minded, always reviewing, always considering how can we create that environment. And Sam, Emma's speaking there to a little accountability helps in canvassing the, the views, the opinions of your members, your community, your, uh, your staff and saying what's working, what isn't. Hold me accountable to these standards. This is where we want to go. 
what would you add to that in terms of your best advice for a, a culturally diverse workforce? I think you've got to, in addition to, I mean, I totally agree with everything that's been said, but I think also look at your structure. What, what, what do you do in, in the way things are done that maybe create barriers you haven't thought about? Are you having, you know, partners meetings at half past six in the morning because billable hours start at seven o'clock? Um, you know, and, and women with children cannot be at the office at half past six or it's really, really challenging. Um, so there's a whole lot of things you might want to think about structurally. And, and things can be done differently to achieve the same outcome. Just because it's always been done down in a certain way to achieve that outcome doesn't mean there aren't another 10 roads to get there. And I think that's what co that's one of the biggest lessons we can take away from COVID because we all thought we had to do something in a certain way in order to be successful. And we've all learned we can be successful doing it completely differently. Yeah. And so I think, you know, look at your structures and ask people about your structures. You, you don't know what the barriers are. Your experience is your experience. You've got to ask, listen, yeah. talk, um, and, and, and understand what it is to be 25, 35, whatever it is in your firm. Sure. We've got one firm that I'm so proud of that this year became, having moved from a male-only partnership, this year became a female majority or majority female partnership. It's the end of the world. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and that was absolutely intentional. And they've changed, totally changed how they thought about partnership, what, what partners do. Um, and they changed their structure in order to enable change. And, and I think that's what it's about. I love that. I can hear some baby boomer men <laughs> shouting in the, behind the teeth right now. But this, this is absolutely bang on, ladies. It's great. Kirsty, uh, last words to you here. We have, we have traditionally worked in a male-dominated world with the professions that we've chosen for ourselves. Uh, I'm on your side as much as I can be, but you've grown up with this. What would be your advice to build a culturally diverse community and a workforce and staff and everything else? I think partly technology has really helped because, um, you know, I, I am, as well as being a woman, as well as being a mother, I'm also a northerner in England. And that makes a difference to uh, to the southern firms, certainly the ones in the central London. Just so explain I'm now... to Pam what being a northerner means. <laughs> a northerner means. Too, There's a big <laughs> yes. north-south divide in, Very in big. UK, Pam. Yeah. But previously, I wouldn't have been able to do some of the work I'm doing now, pre-COVID, simply because I couldn't get into London four days a week it was just impossible for me to to do that journey so and, and have that commitment to it so but now I can do it so I think yeah diversity across all areas whether it's gender whether it's sexuality whether it's background which is a massive one in accountancy I think as well um, I would say to leaders from a practical point of view here if you can really if you want to retain the best people and no matter what background whether they're women men or whatever then Think about, as, as we've said, their experience, but personalise their development plan. So make sure they have a journey to go on that they know is suitable for them. And for me at the time, that would have been term time working, you know, to, which is which was unheard, absolutely unheard of uh, until I came across it about 15 or 16 years ago by the BBC. So the BBC were offering their employees term time working, men and women. Which so for our listeners, sorry, just to explain, it's working when school's on, when yep. semester's on, and when Only the school holidays school are on, hours. you have time off because yeah. your kids are at home. Yeah, so you're still working long hours during the week, but the school holidays, you don't work. And, and that would have been a great solution for me um, from a childcare perspective, but also from a lifestyle perspective. And I still try to have as many of those in holidays that I work for myself. So yeah, personalize their development plan, find out what will work for them and what their drivers are. They might want to take a year out, you know, no matter what, what age or, or what, um, you know, gender they are, they might go traveling for a year. They might want to go and work on some charity project. You just don't know what their personal drivers are until you ask and definitely be much more open and um, observant of that and try and facilitate it. Yeah. 
Well, thank you to all of you for sharing such a lot of uh, great examples and insights. Uh, I'd love to ask you what kind of a leader you are in terms of, are you the arm around the shoulder and the comforter and the encourager? Or are you are, are you the disruptor and the agitator and the, the pushing people and making them do things? And I guess you would all say that there's room for everything, isn't there? I'm incredibly laid back, Rob, with very, very hands off, very trusting until the moment I'm not. <laughs> you know? I, I, yeah. I get you, Kirsty. Yeah. yeah indeed. Well, thank you so much for your time, your insights, your passion today. It's been lovely to have you on. And uh, we'll see you on the next panel that we have. I'm sure you'll come back on some of the future panels that we're doing. We applaud women in accounting and finance. We applaud the female leaders out there that are changing the world so that this becomes a non-conversation and we all become gender blind and it comes down to the best person doing the best job in the best situation, whatever gender they are. And let's not get into all the agendas. Thank you so much, all of you. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.